medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram COVID-19 update. We're going to talk about the new boosters that have been authorized for use in COVID-19, and they're called bivalent boosters. And the reason why they're called that is because they have two different mRNAs to code for two different types of spike protein. And this is necessary because Omicron is so different than the original Wuhan strain of SARS-CoV-2. And what we're going to do in this video is go over the data Please don't expect that at the end of this video, it's going to be a resounding, yes, 100%, you should get a bivalent booster, or the opposite, saying that there's no way you should touch a bivalent booster. And the reason is, is because medicine is nuanced. And a lot of what depends on whether or not a physician is going to recommend something to his patient depends on not just the risks and benefits of the intervention, but also the findings in the patient themselves. And of course, every one of you that's listening to this is different. And we're going to go over and help you to understand why the bivalent booster may be something that you may want to consider or maybe not. And so really the purpose of this is to give you as much information as possible so you understand the data. You should also understand where this information is coming from. So who are we? Who is MedCram? MedCram is a medical education company. We've been around for over 10 years. We make medical education material for healthcare providers. We're not paid by pharmaceutical companies, and we're certainly not interested in politics either. We believe in health optimization. We believe in doing things that are going to improve your immune system, things like sleep, rest, sunshine, living a healthy lifestyle, but also taking advantage of medical technology when it's available. I'm a pulmonary and critical care sleep specialist. I have internal medicine boards, pulmonary boards, sleep boards, and critical care boards, and I'm a professor at two Southern California medical schools. And again, MedCram is the producer of multiple continuing medical education videos for not only students, but also major organizations and universities. So let's get into the data and talk about what it is that's going on with the bivalent boosters. So these are the two available bivalent boosters currently. This is the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine bivalent. As you can see here, it has both the original and the Omicron variant in it. It's a booster dose only. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means. And the other one is the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine bivalent, also the original and the Omicron. And specifically, it's the BA4 and BA5, which is the most recent variant that we see of SARS-CoV-2. So why would you need to consider this? Let's take a look at the current vaccine booster regime. There's a number of different categories that one might fall into. This specifically, this product, this bivalent product is only for people who have gotten at least the first two shots of the vaccine. This is not for people who have not been vaccinated. This is not a primary series, as what they would say. So there's people in the United States and around the world that have gotten their first and second dose of either the mRNA vaccines or the AstraZeneca, for instance. What they're looking at here is a primary vaccine schedule, and then they're considering boosters. If they've gotten their first and second booster, if it's been two months since the last booster, they're eligible to get the bivalent booster. Or if they've only gotten one booster shot, they could be eligible for their bivalent booster shot. Or if they've gotten no boosters, they could be eligible for a bivalent booster if it's been two months since their primary vaccination schedule. The one thing that you should understand here is that with the emergency use authorization of this new bivalent booster, the old boosters are going to go away. They're no longer going to be available. And that's because they want to update the boosters so that there is representation of BA5, which accounts for greater than 95% of the current SARS-CoV-2 infections. So what they've done is they have made Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna They've taken, instead of 30 microgram dose boosters that are all based on the original, they're now splitting it 50-50. 15 micrograms in the Pfizer-BioNTech is of the original spike protein, and the other 15 micrograms is the mRNA for the BA4-5 spike protein. So together, it still makes a 30 microgram dose. You should understand that you're not getting more material in that bivalent booster. For Moderna, because they always had the 50 microgram dose, they split it 50-50 at 25 micrograms, 25 micrograms with the original that they had and also the BA4-5. Pfizer-BioNTech would be available for those 12 years and up and the Moderna for 18 years and up. And specifically, again, it would be people who have had their last shot more than two months previous. 
So why is this bivalent thing an issue? It's an issue because there have been so many different types of variants since the original Wuhan virus back in 2020. The first real strain to sort of hit was the alpha strain in blue. And then you can see here, as kind of like reigning monarchs, each one took their time in the limelight, and then it went to Delta. And then you can see after Delta, it went to Omicron BA1. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. That's when they started thinking about doing variants and actually came out with a variant that was specifically against the BA1. But then you see here there was kind of like a dual reigning regime here of BA2 and BA2.121. And then finally, we had a little bit of a BA4, but now the major one that we're seeing here in the summer of 2022 is Omicron BA5. That is the lion's share of the variants that we're seeing. And so the question is, is could we improve the efficacy in terms of booster shots if we made a spike protein that more closely resembled the circulating spike protein in SARS-CoV-2, which is the Omicron BA5, rather than basing it off the original variant or original wild type, as they would call it at the beginning? So the reason why this is looked at is because we've had data for some period of time that looked at the waning effectiveness of the vaccine. And these were different studies that were carried out in different countries looking at the efficacy of vaccines against various things like infection and hospitalization. So let's take a look at that. There's three different categories that we're looking at here. There is effectiveness against symptomatic infection, effectiveness against any infection, and then importantly, effectiveness against hospitalization. So these are very different things. If we look at this, we can see here that we're looking at weeks along the x-axis, weeks. So 20 weeks, 30 weeks, that's a long time. That's more than half a year that we're looking at. And notice what we're seeing here is in terms of effectiveness against symptomatic infection. Remember when they first came out, 94, 95% effectiveness preventing infection. But that quickly went down to a point of about 70%, at least for the Pfizer in the English study and Moderna, maybe down to about 80 something percent in the English study. So the question is, is why was this happening? Was it happening because of difference in variants? Was it happening because the immune system in the person's body was just not responding well enough to the vaccine? There were a lot of questions at this time. Here we see, again, very similar category against any type of infection. Pfizer in a U.S. study went down to almost 50%. And Pfizer in a Canadian study, not so far, maybe about 75 to 80%. And then Moderna in a Canadian study about the same. So not small reductions here in efficacy in terms of infection. So that means spreading the virus. Now, is it zero? Is it zero? Does it not work at all? Absolutely not. We have to be cognizant here that this is not an all or nothing. It's not like it works 100% or it works 0%. It works somewhere in between. Like most interventions in life, things work in between. And so for the general look at it, yes, the vaccines in terms of preventing infection did decline, no question about it, but never did they drop below 50%. So it's not 0%, it's above 50%. Let's look at the most serious complication of SARS-CoV-2, which is hospitalization. And actually death is the most serious complication, but generally speaking, most people are hospitalized before they die. If your hospital system is not overrun like it was in the early portion of the pandemic. So what we see here is very little erosion of the efficacy of these mRNA vaccines to prevent hospitalization. Look here at this Canadian study, Pfizer, really hardly any decrement in efficacy. This English study looking at Pfizer, Moderna study in Canada, anywhere in these ranges here, there's pretty good continuation of effectiveness against the worst outcomes, specifically hospitalization. So that's interesting to note because the question is, is do we really need to have an update in the variants in terms of these bivalent boosters? That's a legitimate question to have in the face of this data. But the question remains is why was there an erosion in the first place? Was it because of the immune system or was it because of something else? And I think there's some interesting data and here's some of that interesting data. Let's again look at, for instance, Moderna and Pfizer. These are both the mRNA vaccines. Let's keep it to just the two doses so we can see what they look like after the primary vaccine series. What we see here is when we went from alpha to delta, these are two different variants. Notice what happens here in terms of Pfizer, that there is a slight decline in efficacy against symptomatic infection. Again, we're looking at infection here. Going from alpha to delta, there was a decline. In an Israel study, 
there was a decline. In a Canadian study, there was a decline. What about hospitalization? No decline. Very minimal decline here. Again, what we're looking at here is where we are seeing the worst declines is when we're talking about a vaccine's ability to prevent infection, not in terms of hospitalization and death. It seems as though the decline may not be completely related to the person's immune system, but may be related to a switch in the predominant variant in the population. Let's go back and remind ourselves what we're looking at here. We're looking at these declines that are occurring over 20 to 30 weeks. That's almost half a year. That's certainly enough time for one variant to switch to another. Let's go back and take a look at that again. Here you can see the different variants. They don't last more than three or four months. And then there's another variant. And that could certainly be the reason why we're seeing a decline in terms of infection because the antibody response against those spike proteins needs to be pretty tight to prevent infection, but the T cells are a lot more forgiving and vaccine efficacy is going to be maintained when it comes to mortality and hospitalization. Antibodies are not the end-all, be-all of vaccinations. There are a whole downstream effect. For instance, T cells, again, help against some of the worst outcomes of COVID-19, like hospitalization. The T cell response is so broad that it is able to maintain efficacy even in light of rapid mutations from the spike protein. So here's some interesting data that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine on March 2nd of 2022 by Dr. Nick Andrews, and we'll put a link in the description below. Let's take a look at vaccine effectiveness. And by vaccine effectiveness, we're talking about just symptomatic infection. We're not talking about deaths here, we're talking about symptomatic infection. This time looking at Delta versus Omicron. So here is effectiveness here at the first dose. Here it is at the second dose. And let's see what happens as we go 2 to 9, 10 to 14, 15 to 19, 20 to 24, 25 plus weeks. There is a decline here if we stay within the variant. There is a decline. There's no question about it. But notice, time does not seem to be giving us most of the decline. But in fact, it is the variants that are giving us the biggest decline. So what is driving the majority of the decline in effectiveness of the vaccine? I would say it is not actually time and the immune system, but rather different variants of prominence. If you take that to heart, then you would have to say that we can improve vaccine effectiveness, specifically against symptomatic infection, if we match up the mRNA in the vaccine with the prominent variant that's out there in the public. Let's get some real world data. Let's go to the Texas Health and Human Services website. So this is data that's coming from the Texas Department of State Health Services. It's not derived from any other organization, pharmaceutical or other. It's simply the data that the state of Texas is gathering on its residents as they come down with SARS-CoV-2 or they are hospitalized or die. What they are reporting, and this is through August 19 of 2022, looking at the last and most recent 28 days with available data compared to fully vaccinated Texans, unvaccinated Texans were 12 times more likely to test positive for COVID-19 and 26 times more likely to die of a COVID-19 associated illness. And so there is a difference between cases and deaths. Cases can be diagnosed at an official testing center and the state can actually keep track of that. Or it could happen on a home test where you're not able to keep track of that. And there could be different severities in terms of those who are vaccinated and not. So we can take this 12X with a grain of salt. Maybe it's less than that. It's possible. There are some variables in that equation. But the 26X here, I think, is a little bit more reliable number in this case because the endpoints here with people in the hospital, it is being kept track of whether or not they were vaccinated. So I think this 26X is probably a little bit more of a reliable number. But what I really find very helpful here is their ability to actually graph this. And we can actually break it down by age. Because if we do this, we'll find some very interesting data. What I have up here, and you can do this yourself, we'll give you the link to this site so you can look at it, is we have the 12 to 17 year olds. And what we're looking at here, very importantly, is cases. We're looking at infections, not in hospitalizations, specifically deaths, but rather cases. We're looking at the ability of the vaccine to prevent infections. 
So as the pandemic moved on, home testing became more and more available. And so it's possible that less severe infections may have resulted in home testing and more severe infections may have resulted in this type of testing that would have been recorded at the state. That is a potential confounder, but I think it's important to go over this data from an age-specific standpoint because it'll make sense later on when we're talking about who should consider getting bivalent boosters, especially if we're talking about bivalent boosters that include BA5 and 4, which are included in the current set that has been given authorization. And what we have here are two bumps, and you'll see this throughout this analysis. The first bump here is Delta, the Delta wave, as we all remember, from the summer of 2021. And then at the beginning of 2022, at the end of 2021, we have Omicron. What we see here is the dotted lines are the unvaccinated. That means they did not get either of the first two doses. And the solid line here is the vaccinated, meaning that they only got the first two doses. What do we notice here? We can see here that as things are going along, there is a small increased risk here for getting infection. It's not very large, but a small one here between the unvaccinated and the vaccinated. And then what happens here in August is Delta comes on the scene and there is a pretty wide splay. So we can see here that there is an increased risk and we can actually see it here, the fully vaccinated rate, the unvaccinated rate, and this age group. This is in the 12 to 17 year old group, very young. And we still see here a pretty large splay. And then it goes away. Now notice what happens here when we get to Omicron. Notice that this vaccinated risk is very small compared to the peak of the unvaccinated. When we get to Omicron, it disappears. I mean, it's almost as high. What does that tell you? It tells you that the ability of the vaccine to prevent infection with Omicron was much less than it was with Delta. And why is that? Again, it's because of the confirmation of the spike protein with Omicron, which is significantly different. Neither of these variants were represented in the vaccine because the vaccine is based on the original Wuhan strain, but specifically Omicron was so infectious that the vaccine was not a very good help at preventing infections here in the 12 to 17 year old age group. Now, as we go along here, notice that there still seems to be a little bit of a advantage with the vaccine, even after this huge Omicron spike. Okay, let's go to the next age group, 18 to 29. That's in yellow. I'm going to go ahead and take off the 12 to 17 year old group so we have a little bit more clarity. Same thing again. Notice here, vaccinated, much more protected against infections, infections, not hospitalization or death. Not so much here with Omicron. And we see here with subsequent Omicron variants, we're seeing a very similar situation here in terms of protection against Omicron. This is probably four or five down here at this range. Let's go on to the next age group. Very similar, although it seems to be not as high. There seems to be more protection here as we go in age. Similar thing here for the 30 to 39 year old group. Let's go to the 40 to 49 here. Again, much higher than it was over here with Delta and over here even at the very beginning. Much better performance here, a little bit less. Not very good performance here in terms of infection. That's the key here, cases infection. Let's go to the next age group. We're getting older and older. It seems as though this difference is increasing so that the vaccine in these older age groups in terms of preventing infection may be improving. And let's go on to the 65 to 74. Aha, notice there is some decline in this age group, but it's not as much. So in other words, even in the older 65 to 74 year old age group, even though the Omicron variant did not have as much protection from the vaccine for patients, it was better than in the other age groups. And then finally, let's go to 75 plus and notice how small these are. And this is probably because 75 year old plus don't get infected as much. They're probably taking more conservative measures. This is all in contrast to deaths. We're going to select deaths now, and we're going to start over at the beginning. So notice here, there's no data for 12 to 17 year olds, and that's because hardly any of them died. It's really hard to give you data. And I believe that's the same for the 18 to 29 year old group, as you can see here. Now, when we start to actually get into deaths, we're getting into the 30 to 39 year old group. A lot of people said that 30 year olds don't die of COVID. Well, I have news for you. I've witnessed it myself. But notice that it's very jagged. So this is not a lot of data points. There's not a lot of people that died in that age group, but there is nonetheless. Notice the efficacy of the vaccine in Delta continued for the most part in Omicron. And why, again, it's because those antibodies to the spike protein are not the big determinant when it comes time to determine whether you die or not of COVID-19. 
Again, it's a question about preventing death. Maybe a bivalent update is not the most important thing because the primary vaccination status is good enough to prevent death. Now notice here that in both cases, the risk of death is really, really low over here compared to where it was over here in both the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. And my theory on that is, is that Omicron was so transmittable that over here, as opposed to over here, your unvaccinated populations over here have, for the most part, gotten immunity from infection. And that's why we're not seeing a big difference between the unvaccinated over here and the vaccinated. It's because Omicron even things out so much in the unvaccinated that you really can't tell much of a difference now between those two. And I think you'll see that as we go along. Let's go to the 40 to 49-year-old group. More deaths here, so you notice that this looks smoother, unfortunately. Again, notice here, big difference between unvaccinated and vaccinated in terms of death. Huge difference here with Delta. Still, the difference is maintained here with Omicron, but because Omicron was so infectious, there's hardly any difference in terms of death rates now between those who are vaccinated and those who are not. There could be another surge, and that might show up, but at this point, not seeing that in the 40 to 49. All right, let's go to the 50 to 64 age group. Again, what we're looking at here is the Delta. Notice that the advantage of the vaccinated in the Delta surge is held up in the Omicron surge, again, because death is not really dependent too much on variant. It just doesn't seem to be that case. Here, there's a big difference between those that are vaccinated and those that are not vaccinated in Texas. And here, it is diminished. And I think, again, the fact that they're diminished is because the unvaccinated death rate has gone down. Why is that? My theory would be is because they've now retained immunity from previous infection. But notice it does seem to be splaying a little bit more, and that happens as we go up in age here. So here we are again. Here is the difference between vaccinated and unvaccinated prior to Delta in Omicron. A little bit higher risk here for the vaccinated in Omicron. Huge spike in Omicron. There was a lot of people that got Omicron infection. And what we're looking at here is in the older group, there still remains probably the same difference as there was back here. And that may be because that infection in the elderly, the thing that would help you get immunity in the young, doesn't seem to help as much in the elderly because of their immune status. Their immune system is not as functional. Let's go to 75 plus years. And you can see here that we're pretty much where we were here at the end as we were here in the beginning. So in summary, the data seems to indicate that as you get older, the immune system needs a bit more direction or assistance, and that vaccination or boosters may actually be beneficial. And that's something that you might want to take into consideration when you're considering the bivalent booster. We've looked at the population data. Let's talk about these bivalent vaccines themselves. What kind of data do we have on them? What kind of actual efficacy and safety data do we have on these bivalent BA4-5 that are coming out? To do that, we've got to talk about some of the background on this. You'll hear a lot of different things on the internet. You'll hear like, oh, these things are tested very well. There's nothing to worry about. And then on the other extreme, you'll hear that this was only tested on eight mice. That's the only data that we have on any of this stuff. And of course, both of those are extremes. And when you actually look at the data, like we will here and now, you'll see that it's a little bit more nuanced. The reality is, is that it's somewhere in between those two extremes. So there actually is human data on bivalent mRNA vaccines. And actually, this goes back a year or more. Specifically, this was not an Omicron bivalent vaccination. It was a different variant. But this is a human trial that looked at the vaccine effectiveness and also side effects. There are two other human trials, and I want to be very clear here to make sure that everyone understands. These are looking at the BA1. So what they did was back in the earlier portion of 2022, when the predominant was Omicron, they wanted to come out with a booster. By the time they got that all worked out, we were already headed to BA45 kind of made it outdated. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing Pfizer-BioNTech coming up with a booster that is half of the original Wuhan and half of the BA1. And Moderna did a very similar one where they did the same sort of thing. They made a bivalent where half of it is based off of BA1 and half of it is based on the original Wuhan strain. In the case of Pfizer-BioNTech, they only gave us a press release, which is unfortunate. I really would have liked to have seen a publication. I tried looking for it. If you guys can find it, please let me know, and I'll put it in the link in the description below. In their press release, they released this data. 
1,234 subjects that were randomized to receive either the regular Pfizer-BioNTech booster or either a monovalent booster, which just had the BA1, or a bivalent booster, which had the BA1 and the original Wuhan strain. And they put it out also, by the way, in a 30 microgram and a 60 microgram dose. You remember, they had always put out 30 microgram doses, so this was kind of new. They were trying to see what Moderna was doing and increase the dose to see if they could get better efficacy. And so what they did was they had the control, which is the normal booster, and then they had these four. And what they did was they looked at the mean titer to BA1 after that booster shot was done. You'll see this term used called the geometric mean titer ratio. When something is nonlinear, you can't take the arithmetic mean. You have to take the geometric mean. That's a mathematical statistical thing. It's just a better way of taking the mean. So that's what they did with these so that the extremes would not make the mean be distorted. And then they looked at the geometric mean of the titers, and then they looked at the ratio. So in other words, how did it compare to the control? That's what they were looking at. So compared to the control, the 30 microgram monovalent had 2.23 times the geometric mean of the titer. The 60 microgram had 3.15 times that of the control. The bivalent had 1.56, and the bivalent 60 microgram had 1.97. And there are confidence intervals, and I didn't want to put them in there because it's a lot of numbers, and you can look it up in the press release, which we'll put a link to in the description below. Moderna did actually have a preprint, so you can actually read the study. And now this paper has been published in the New England Journal of Medicine on September 16th, and we'll put a link to that paper below. They had about 814 in their study. The average age was 57 years of age. And again, they did the same thing. They compared the following amount, with they only did one, to a current, this should say Moderna, not Pfizer, booster, and looked at the antibody titer against, again, Omicron BA1. They're doing this against BA1. And so what they did, essentially, is they took their original booster, which is the mRNA-1273, and they wanted to look and see how the BA1 would look, and that's mRNA-1273.214. For those of you who are interested, the mRNA against the BA45 is 222, BA45. In this case, they did it the BA1, and what they found is that the bivalent was 1.75. So let's take a look at these numbers here. Notice, first of all, that the monovalent actually looks better than the bivalent, which is what you would expect because you're trying to see how well do these antibodies react against the BA1 spike. Well, obviously, the monovalent BA1 is going to look better against BA1. But remember that there could be other strains out there. They want to make sure that they are giving broad coverage against other variants, et cetera, et cetera. So even though the monovalent was higher, practically, they're going to probably go with the bivalent. And we'll show you some data on that in a little bit. Notice that the 30 microgram dose gave you 1.56, the 50 microgram dose gave you 1.75, and the 60 microgram dose gave you 1.97. So there may be a dose dependent response to this. Moderna tested it against BA45 because we're kind of late in the game when they came out. They actually printed this a little bit late, and they noticed that the BA1 had a good response against BA45, but realize that this is not the product that's going to FDA. They are not sending their 1273.214. They're sending their 1273.222 against the BA45. Why? Because that's what's the predominant. And so these are human studies, but it's on the BA1, not the BA45. And that's where the concern is. What's the difference between BA1 and BA45? Well, very little is different between those two but they are different. So how little is it? It's four out of 4,000 nucleotide changes between BA1 and BA5. So we have human data on something that's extremely close to BA4.5, but it's not exactly BA4.5. The only data that we actually have on BA4.5 is data on mice. And now why did we want to do that? Why are we willing to go forward and do BA4.5? Again, it's because of these changing variants. Why would we want to do a bivalent on this, which is long gone? This is what was going on in February of 2022, when we could be hitting, even though it's slightly different, the stuff that's going around now in September, August of 2022. By the way, as you can see, it's headed to go down. The question is, is what's going to come up later? Is it another Omicron? We're not sure. 
So this is the data that I was talking about. Here is the BA1, 1273.214. And notice that in terms of titers against Omicron BA4.5, which is out there, it's not bad. You can see here, this is the pre-booster, and this is day 29, pre-booster, day 29, pre-booster, day 29, in everybody, people who have never had an infection before, and people that have had an infection, a breakthrough infection previously. So notice that those that have had prior infection have increased antibody levels overall compared to those that don't. That's where this hybrid immunity comes in. But notice that in both situations, it raised it up and improved it, even against BA4.5. So should we just go with the BA1 bivalent since we have human data on that? Well, that's not what they decided to do. Here's the data on BA4.5. This is the mice data. Notice the N is equal to 8. And it's not uncommon for scientists to use mice data to determine the vaccine effectiveness. This is done all the time in yearly flu shots to make sure that the flu shot specifically targets the variants that are going to be coming out that year. Currently, Pfizer and Moderna are working on human safety and efficacy trials. And so that will be available for the bivalent BA4, BA5 booster, probably in October of 2022. So what are they looking at here? This is Omicron BA4.5 monovalent and bivalent boosters in mice substantially increase Omicron neutralization responses to all Omicron variants, including BA4.5 and reference strain. They say here, compared to monovalent OMI BA1, that's this one right here, BA4.5 neutralizing titers increase by 11-fold or 4.8-fold if it's the bivalent. So what are they saying here? They're looking specifically here because that's the variant that's going around right now. And what they're saying is, is that if you use the monovalent BA1, which is the antibody to the circulating virus in February, this is what you get in terms of circulating antibodies. Now notice this is a logarithmic scale, so each one of these is tenfold. If you use the monovalent BA4.5, it's up here. That's a tenfold improvement, or in this case, as they show you, 11.3-fold. However, if we go to a bivalent where we have the original thrown in at 50% and the new one thrown in at 50%, notice what it does here. It's still higher. Not as much higher, but it's still higher, 4.8 fold. Notice that for BA1, monovalent is actually better than the bivalent. But again, there's this want to make sure that we're still getting the original variant in the booster shot. Why don't we just go with a BA1 bivalent? And the answer is clearly here, because the BA1 is not as good as the BA4.5 in terms of BA4.5. That's pretty intuitive. Why don't we just do a monovalent as opposed to a bivalent? Antibody titers are not the end-all be-all of immunity. The worst outcomes, death and hospitalization, also depend on T cells, and that's not captured here in this mouse study. So obviously we need more human studies to get better ideas about exactly what the efficacy is going to be. But before we delay any further, let's talk about safety. So what we're looking at here is a graph from the New England Journal of Medicine paper published on the Moderna bivalent booster. Again, this is looking at 1273.214, and that's important to know because what we're looking at here is the BA1, and we're looking at the original. Now, keep in mind, this is not the BA5, but we're comparing the original with the BA1, which is very different. These are very different mRNA transcripts in the sense that we're going from the original all the way to BA1. And notice here that for the most part, these are all very similar. What we're looking at here is solicited local and systemic adverse events in the any category, the pain, erythema, swelling, and the axillary swelling and tenderness we're looking at grade one, which is mild, grade two, which is moderate, and grade three, which is severe. And as you can see, the original mRNA and the BA1 mRNA elicit very similar local and systemic adverse reactions. The question is, is when there's only a difference between BA1 and BA5 of four out of 4,000 nucleotides, do we expect that to be much different? Interesting question. And remember, these numbers here represent percentages of the patients in the study. Here's the second page of that slide. And you can see here, again, here are the systemic findings. Again, any systemic fever, headache, fatigue, myalgia, arthralgia, nausea, vomiting, and chills. You can see across the board that these numbers are fairly similar. 
So adverse reactions were looked at for seven days after the injection. And the frequency of grade three events was 8% in both groups. And the most commonly reported grade three adverse reactions were fatigue, with both having about 3%, and myalgia, with 2% in the Omicron bivalent, and 4% in the regular original mRNA vaccine from Moderna, respectively. And there were no grade four events in either group. You should also know that unsolicited adverse events, regardless of the relationship to vaccination, up to 28 days after the second booster were reported. And in the bivalent, it was 19%. And in the regular mRNA Moderna shot, it was 21%. The overall incidence of adverse events considered related to the study vaccination by the investigator was 6% in both booster groups. In terms of serious adverse events, there were two participants in the bivalent that experienced prostate cancer and traumatic fracture, and one participant in the regular control mRNA vaccine group that reported a serious adverse event of spinal osteoarthritis within 28 days of the booster dose. So at the end of the day, what are all of the reasons for getting a bivalent booster and those against it? What does this do? We already have very good protection against the worst outcomes in terms of death, in terms of hospitalization, from the standard mRNA vaccines. But if you're older and you want to prevent infections or some of the worst outcomes, it may be beneficial. What would be some reasons that you would say, I think we should get the bivalent booster? Well, if you want better immunity against the current variants, the fact that generally the same serious adverse events and that there's only a 4 in 4,000 change. We think that that's not a big difference. We don't know that for sure. Older age, as we saw in the Texas data. Medical problems. If you've got a lot of medical problems, you have comorbidities, and if you work in a high-risk environment, or if you have sick contacts. And I didn't put this on there, but in fact, if there is better immunity against the current variant, Omicron BA.4.5, and that actually prevents transmission, it is possible that we could reduce transmission of the infection and reduce the pandemic in terms of numbers. But that is not a tangible at this point, and we don't have further data on that as yet. And of course, we don't know if this is potentially beneficial in terms of preventing long COVID as well. So that's another potential as well. What about against? You don't have sick contacts. You work in a low-risk environment. You're generally healthy. You're young. You're worried about the fact that we don't have human studies comparing on the exact version. You may even have possible post-infectious immunity where you're not concerned. Maybe you already have been infected with Omicron, in which case you probably are going to be the beneficiary of antibodies that are going to be specific against that. So what do some experts say about this? We've interviewed Professor Shane Crotty, who's been on here from the La Jolla Institute for Immunology. This is what he said on his Twitter feed, and I think it reflects a lot of what we're saying. He says here, a decision about getting a booster also depends on your personal risk assessment, which is reasonable. You should also consult your doctor about your health situation. If your only goal is to not be hospitalized, your current vax or post-infection immunity may very well be fine. That's exactly what we're saying here. He says, however, if your goal is to minimize the risk of catching COVID this fall or winter, either to protect yourself or the people around you and minimize your risk of long COVID, the new booster vax is the right choice because the newer COVID variants are so ultra-infectious and pathogenic. We've also had Professor Eric Topol, who's the director of Scripps Research Institute. He's a professor of molecular medicine. He's also a cardiologist. He's put together a great page looking at the risks and benefits as well in this pluses and minuses. He emphasizes the issues pretty well here. The pluses of this bivalent, this is the first time it's been updated since 2020. But again, no BA5 variant-specific human neutralizing antibody data. We just have it in those eight mice. It matches current BA5 wave and current related variants. That's great. Unknown if it's going to be better. It was done in about two months, which is great. But because it was done so quickly, there's going to be some hesitancy to say, well, is this really what we want to do? It's interesting because he's correct here. It relies on flu vaccine updating, and that is true. So we all the time every year update our flu vaccine and tweak it without human data. And we do that based on what we believe the newest variant is going to be so we have protection. But we don't have human data before that goes out. So this is not absolutely new stuff we're talking about here. But the counter argument is that, well, SARS-CoV-2 is not influenza. It's a different virus. Maybe we do need to have that data. 
Another interesting argument, he says, is prior human data for immune response to BA1 and beta variants. Minuses are the potential of imprinting to diminish the effect. Would BA5 monovalent vaccine be better? And this is the question that we didn't answer. He says here that you give a bivalent, so it has a little bit of the original, has a little bit of the BA5, and all the vaccine tells the immune system is since it's seen the original first, because you're boosting, is it going to ignore BA5 in a human situation? So I think those are some interesting questions. You can read the rest of that chart, but I think it's an interesting argument. There are a lot of experts that are divided on this, so certainly there's questions to be asked, and we should have an environment where we can ask all of those questions. Well, that was a summary. Unfortunately, we couldn't cover everything, but those are the major salient points in terms of the bivalent booster so that you can make a decision about whether or not you feel like this is something that is right for you. And I highly encourage you to talk to your treating physician about whether or not the bivalent booster is good for you specifically. And I highly encourage you to visit our website at medcram.com for more continuing medical education topics like EKG, ultrasonography, and ventilator courses. We've had some people reach out to us and ask us whether or not there are any shirts with Medcram on it, and we've made those available. So if you're interested, you can get those as well on our YouTube channel. I want to thank you for joining us and make sure you're getting enough sleep, getting outside, getting some sunshine, fresh air, and exercise. These are truly the things that make us healthy. Thanks for joining us.